All right, you're going to have to click it for me. Uh, so, well, go back. <laughs> there we go. Now something's passed out. Um, my topic today that I want to be talking about with everyone is, is the idea of having a pure heart, being pure of heart. Now, this trait is mandatory if we want to be pleasing to God, if we want to be a good Christian, a good servant. Uh, we have to have a pure heart. And so my goal for this lesson is that you take away three points and, and we learn better how we can have a pure heart as Christians. Now, before we get into this, I, I want to preface that there's no way we can earn salvation. We, we will never be worthy, deserving of, of God's gift. But, and we know, of course, that His grace is what saves us. But there are things that God expects us to do that are pleasing to him. And so that's kind of what I want us to focus on today. Um, so point number one, to be pure in heart, we must do the little thing. Now, how many of y'all have heard this growing up, whether it be from a parent, <clears throat> a teacher, a coach? You got to do the little things right. Math teachers, it's very important. If you get one little thing wrong, it messes up the whole equation, Right? How many of you, and I know I've probably said it 20 times this week, coaches or, or players have heard from coaches, do the little things. They make the biggest difference. How many of y'all have heard that? Raise your hand. All right, all of us, we've heard that. Little things make a huge difference. And I think we can apply that spiritually as well. The little things, doing little things sometimes have the greatest impact. Napoleon, the great general that conquered almost all of Europe, Asia, Africa, one of the greatest conquerors in the history of mankind, right? Well, he was small. I mean, he was probably about my height, maybe a little shorter. Right, so that's a little thing. But the story goes like this. His only defeat was because he forgot small pins that went inside of his men's cannons. And so at the Battle of Waterloo, when they're in combat versus the greatest force that they had met yet, they couldn't use their cannons. Nothing was malfunctioning other than he had forgotten a small pin about the size of what a, a, a woman might wear in her hair. And that's the reason he, he lost the Battle of Waterloo and led to his demise. Little things, they matter. If we engage in the small things, if we focus on little things, all right, I think it could have a resounding effect in our life. I want to focus on uh, some individuals in the Bible that they did, did little things that had just amazing impact. Most of our kids have been dismissed, all right, but... The first thing that came to my mind was Daniel in the lion's den. Um, Daniel. What got him in that place in the, in the first place? He prayed three times, uh, three times a day. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us that um, he would, every day, he would memorize a whole book of the, the Bible or a whole book of the Scripture. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that... He reached out to a hundred different people a day and he taught a hundred different people about Jesus or about in that time period about God. It doesn't tell us that. It tells us he simply prayed three times a day. Small things. <clears throat> the widow, when she gave her offering, put in two copper coins worth Practically nothing. Pennies. But Jesus said she has given more than anyone else. It's the little things that matter. And if we will start doing the little things in our life, it's going to activate incredible, incredible change. When I was going off to college, so when I had graduated high school, the most lucrative day of my life, 
You know, you get, you get gifts, you get money gifts when you graduate um, from people wanting to bless you and, and make sure you're taken care of while you're at college. Um, and so my church had a big event for me and all my senior and all the seniors, similar to what we do here at North Highlands. And I saw a big stack of envelopes of, of people who had given me money, not because they liked me. I was kind of a punk, but because they liked my dad and my mom. Um, and so I had this big stack of envelopes and I opened them and, and there was tens and twenties and fifties and hundred dollar bills and gift cards. And all of this money added up to well over, I would probably say $2,000. Very, very generous. Um, it, it, it helped me tremendously in college. But the best gift I got, and I'm not trying to diminish what those people did. The best gift I got was from my niece, who was four years old at the time. And as I was about to pull out and go to college, she was living with us at the time. I'm, I'm pulling out and going to college. She taps on my window and says, uh, Kate, I want to give you something. I said, well, that's, that's sweet, Addie. And she gave me two quarters that she had gotten from her piggy bank. And she said, use these and get some gumballs out of the gumball machine at school. <laughs> it's, it's funny, but all oh, my heart just died. I mean, how sweet, how sweet. And that meant more to me than the, the hundreds and, and even the thousands of dollars that I got from others, um, that small gift from my niece, because that was from someone so pure and someone who wanted me to have something, even though she had nothing to give. It's the little things that make the biggest difference. So right now, if you've got the outline or if you've got a piece of paper and something to write with, I want you to write down three Little things that you can do spiritually this week that's going to have a huge impact in the long run. Small things. Maybe you can start off with, I'm not going to fall asleep in his sermon. I'm going to stay awake. All right, that's small, okay? And I know, I'm watching y'all. I know some people who, who fall asleep in my sermons. Um, or it could just be, I'm going to say a prayer each night of the week, a, a two-minute prayer. That's not long. By the time you, you start off with the introduction and ask for the, the necessities, right? You, it's practically been two minutes. Start off with something small like that. Maybe it's reading your Bible. Maybe reading a verse a night. Don't you think that after a while, the, the two-minute prayer might turn into five minutes? Right? Or that one verse that you're reading might turn into a whole chapter and so on and so forth. Something so small can become immeasurable. What about how it impacts others? You start praying for, for two minutes and, and you don't know, notice this, but your, your child walks past and sees you praying. What impact does that have? Think about the impact that that has. Or, 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 or you decide you're going to read one verse a night. That's not a lot for you because you spend eight to ten hours a day at work and, and on all other things. But you choose to, to read one verse and your child walks by and sees you reading that scripture verse. Imagine the impact. What about staying for Bible class? Doing something that small. It's an hour of, of the week. Stay in for Bible class. What an impact. You get 52 more hours of study in God's Word per year if you just stay for Bible class. Something small. Ladies and men, what about modesty? In the clothing that you wear, right? This is a big difference, right? In length. This, this makes a big difference. This is probably what sets us apart from the world, okay? Modesty. And I'm saying guys too because I have these guys at my school, and they are, they're, they're wearing the track shorts all around, all right? Tim, I know you wear them. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean to offend you, all right? 
But ladies, being a little more modest, that makes a statement, doesn't it? Hey, why is, why is her dress a little bit longer than everyone else? Oh, she's a Christian. Or, or why does she reveal just a little bit less than, than everybody else? Oh, because she's a Christian. Little things make a big difference. Smiling, holding the door for people, turning off your phone during church, singing a little louder. And I know no one in here sings as bad as me, okay? And I'm going to sing loud regardless. I know me, me, and, uh, me and Doug, when he sits behind me, man, me and him, we, we tear stuff up, man. I mean, we, it may not sound good, but we, we sing loud, that's for sure. And a lot of times we sing the wrong words. I'm really bad about that. These small things that, have, that otherwise have huge implications on your life, they make a big, big difference. So my advice to you this morning is to start by doing the small things. Number two, to be pure of heart, we must place truth on the highest pedestal. So in a society today where we can't agree that a man can't be a woman and a woman can't be a man, all right? Not everybody has an emphasis on or puts an emphasis on truth. Can we agree about that? Okay. No, not everybody in this society, a lot of people don't emphasize truth. What do they emphasize? How do I feel? Feelings. That's what matters. But I'm here to tell you, to become pure of heart, you have to put truth, you have to place God's word above your personal feelings. Your personal wants, your personal desires. God's word, the truth, must come first. I know y'all probably heard about um, this example of, of the emperor's new clothes. Um, so there's, there's these two con artists. that They come into this empire and they meet with the emperor and they say, Look, we can... Weave you clothing that is invisible to people who are stupid, sorry kids, and incompetent. So we're going to weave you these, these clothes and the people who are incompetent and who are not smart will not see anything. And so they weave the king this robe to wear and they're just doing their hands like this, acting like they're doing something. In reality, they're, they're doing nothing at all. And they, they mimic and, and they act like they're putting it on the em emperor. And they say, oh, how beautiful. This is a beautiful robe. You look amazing in it. Well, the emperor doesn't want to feel dumb or incompetent. So he's like, yeah, this is, this is beautiful. Yeah, I love this robe. And so he, he calls people from his empire in one by one and gets their input. And the people the same way, they don't, want to, uh, they don't want to offend the king and they also don't want to seem incompetent or dumb. So they say, oh, you look great, king. That's a beautiful robe. Meanwhile, the king's just naked. Person after person until one day he says, I'm going to go all around the kingdom and pr have a procession around the kingdom and show off this robe. And so he gets on his chariot and... He's marched around the city and everybody's bowing to him. Oh, how beautiful your robe is. And, and he's naked. And one little kid says, Mommy, he's not wearing any clothes. And everybody bursts out in laughter. Okay. Well, why, why did people not tell him the truth? Why did he believe a lie? Okay. And that, that, that's hit home so much in this society today. We are so concerned with people's feelings without trying, trying not to offend people that the truth gets overlooked. I'm telling you, if you, to love someone, the best thing you can do if you love someone is tell them the truth. Would you agree? Right. Tell them the truth. That's how... You love people. That's how you're going to make people's life better is if you tell them the truth. 
Well, let's look at this from a, a spiritual perspective. There's only one truth. It's this. And as Christians, if we get away from this and we start focusing about, well, here's how I feel on this, or here's how I feel about this, or here's what I want, here's my desire, we're just like the people in that story. We're living off of feeling instead of living off of the truth. I heard a statement the other day, and it goes, facts don't care about your feelings. Now, that's a harsh statement. And when you're having a biblical dis discussion or you're trying to convert somebody um, to Christianity or prove that there's a God, you, you probably don't want to go up to them and say, facts don't care about your feelings. Um, there's probably a more tender tone that you can use, right? But regardless of your feelings, God's truth reigns supreme. And uh, until we get back to that being our top priority, we're not going to be strong as a church. We're not going to be strong as a community or as a nation. God's word has to reign supreme. Is this an easy task? A lot of times, no. Not just the easiest tasks. You have to go against your personal wants, your personal desires, your personal feelings. What about this? Let me ask you this question. Listen to this real quick. What if it's done with pure intentions? Something is incorrectly done, but the people had a pure motive or pure intentions. What do you think about that? Is that okay? Is it okay then? Obviously, we, we all need God's grace, right? But sometimes, even if you do it with pure intentions, a pure motivation... It, sometimes, it still will have devastating, devastating effects. We have to align with God's Word. Think about in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, Uzzah. He's, covering, he, he, he's, he's carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? And he's carrying it on. I, I get this idea of kind of like a stretcher in my mind. And they're walking it around. And, and this beautiful piece that, that is from God, God said, do not touch it. It gets, it gets wobbly. It's about to fall. And Uzzah, I, I, I firmly believe he had pure intentions. He had a pure, his motives were pure. He reached out, tried to stabilize that ark. Well, what happened to him? He died. Because no matter how pure your intentions are, no matter how pure your motive is, God's law reigns supreme. And we see that over and over and over again in the scriptures. Oh, I just want to make worship better and more energetic. I want to insert um, instruments and a praise team and, and all sorts of things. These people are doing that with pure motives. They're just trying to make it better. But we need to step back and, and analyze and examine what does God say on this subject? What is his law? It's a dangerous game when we start calling the shots instead of allowing God to fully dictate everything in our lives. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 119. We're going to be in Psalms chapter 119 in verse 9. Here the, the psalmist is asking the same question that I'm asking you today and really that I'm asking myself. The question is, how can a young man keep his way pure? But for today's context, for our sake, we're going to say how, how, in terms of everybody, women and children and men, how can we keep our ways pure? Well, they give us the answer. The psalmist gives us the answer. He says, by guarding it according to your word, God's word. The psalmist keeps going. With my whole heart, I seek you. 
Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. What is the prime subject in this scripture reading? God's word. How are you to stay pure? How are you to be right in the, in the eyes of God? How are you to be a good servant? With so many different opinions, so many different denominations, so many people telling you different things. Focus on God's word. That's how you remain pure. Keep God's truth on the highest pedestal in your life. Not family tradition or, or not even what I say. Not what your family says, not what your friends say. Not what you've done your whole life. What does God say? And if we ask ourselves that truthfully, we answer it truthfully, and we live underneath the protection of God's Word, then we're going to be blessed, and we're going to be pleasing to God. Uh, next slide. All right, to be pure of heart, we must humble ourselves. You know, as I was writing this lesson and, and, and reading the scriptures, there was a common theme that, that remained true again and again and again as I read through the scriptures. Why is it that the poor that are mentioned in the Bible are almost never in trouble? You notice that? The poor people are almost never in trouble. Why is it that the people who get in trouble... 95% of the time are the rich people. Why is that? Well, it might be the, the, the poor are too busy <laughs> to get in any trouble, right? When you're working all the time, when you're, you're trying to work and feed your family, all you, you don't really have time to get into trouble. Um, <clears throat> David, if you'll flip the next slide. Let's look at David. Think about when David was, David was poor. Right? He was a little shepherd boy. Small, ruddy, poor, not this fancy king. That's when he slayed Goliath. That's when God said, hey, that's a man after my own heart. That's who I want to be king. This poor, ruddy shepherd boy. David poor, good guy. David rich, murderer, fornicator, adulterer. All this money, all this power, all this fame. Now, David did great things even when he was rich, right? But it wasn't until he was rich that when he committed those atrocities. All right? Judas. Poor man. Poor follower of Jesus. Jesus' best friend. One of Jesus' 12 best friends. Good guy when he's poor. He starts getting a hold of the, the money bags. He gets pieces of gold for, for Jesus. Bad guy. Turns him bad. Matthew, oh, this kind of goes in reverse order. Matthew, the tax collector. All right, he starts off rich, collecting taxes. His people hate him. He's a really bad guy. He cheats people out of stuff. All right. And then he meets Jesus and becomes poor. Gives that all up. When he's a rich guy, tax collector, he's not a follower of Jesus, not a really good guy. But when he's poor, 
Pretty good guy. Saul, the first king of Israel, starts off poor. As soon as he gets his, and becomes king, right? Everything changes. Now, I'm not saying that we should strive every day. Hey, how can I be poor today? Okay, I'm not saying that. That's not my intention. I don't go to work saying, uh, let me see how bad of a job I can do today so that I can keep my family in poverty. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying when we emphasize our possessions, when we emphasize our riches and put that on the highest pedestal, that's when we run into a world of trouble. If you're poor, you don't have to worry about adultery because I can't afford the one wife I got, let alone two wives. <laughs> if you're rich in here, I'm not saying that's innately bad. We got a lot of wealthy people in here. Well, from my perspective, I mean, uh, we got a we got a we got a lot of wealthy people in here, and riches are not innately bad. When you give a five year old a million dollars, does that suddenly make that five year old sinful? No, All right, it's not something that that makes you innately bad. All right, but I am saying we have to be on guard. We have to remain humble. If you struggle, it's going to sound funny. If you struggle with being rich, here's what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 19, a rich young man comes to him and says, look, look, I've done everything. You know, I've, I, I say my prayers. I, I read my Bible. I, I don't do this. I don't do that. And I don't do that. I do everything. He says, yeah, you're a rich guy. Sell all your possessions. Come and follow me. That's what Jesus says. Give it away. If you're rich and it's causing you problems, if it's keeping you from the kingdom of God, give it away. Because those riches are not as valuable as the riches that we will have one day in eternity. The solution. <clears throat> what time did I get up here? Have I been up here a while? Longer than usual? Usually I'm 15 minutes and we're done. I, good night. I am getting old. Um, all right, so to wrap this up, in summary, to have a pure heart, we must place truth on the highest pedestal. We must humble ourselves, and we must do the small things. So in your life, when you ask yourselves, when you ask yourselves those questions, you know, am I doing the little things right? which will ultimately lead to the big things. Am I placing truth on the highest pedestal? Or has, has my life been fogged down and my views been fogged by this world? And finally, have you humbled yourself? We are just humble servants. No matter what we do in this life, for Jesus, for God, it's still dirty rags. Think about the most holy person you know. For me, my, 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 my grandfather, I, I, he's my role model. And I, I picture him as, both of them really, as, as some of the most holy, holy men. When they get to heaven one day, their offering is still dirty rags. We have to, to be humble. So, with that being said, in your life, if you, if you have something that you need to change, uh, maybe you need to dedicate your life to Christ. Maybe you need to put on baptism and start that walk with Him so that you can have a home with Him in eternity. Whatever the case is, come right now as we stand and as we sing.